Well, the Lord be with you. You know you're getting two sermons this morning, did you? Thank you, Pat. Turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 12th chapter of Genesis. A story about one who decided indeed to follow God and no turning back. In spite of challenges and twists along the path. Genesis chapter 12, we'll be reading just the first three verses there. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. Make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray for ears to hear. Ears that hear your call to us. In spite of whatever words, Lord, I may put in the way. We pray, Lord, for eyes to see. Eyes to see what you have for us. In spite of what we may hold so tightly in our own hands. We pray for hearts open to receive. Lord, as we release the things that we carry with us that only bring us down. We pray for your presence and to hear and to heed your call this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's strange how quickly 17 years can slip by. Especially when it seems like the first 17 years of one's life take so long to pass. And even though it doesn't feel like that long ago, it was 17 years ago this very day that I stood in a sanctuary for the very first time about to proclaim my faith. Though I wasn't standing in a pulpit. No, I was standing several feet back from the pulpit, behind three or four rows of pews that made up the choir loft, behind the old moss green polyester curtains that had been drawn back, revealing the hand-painted scene of a creek bank on the wall behind the two of us standing waist-deep in the warm water of the baptistry at Goodman Baptist Church. Seventeen years ago today. We didn't wear white robes at Goodman, so I was standing there in blue athletic shorts and a cut-off Nike t-shirt I used to wear under my football pads, when our interim pastor, Brother David Coggins, in his white dress shirt and rubber duck waders, said some words about baptism, some words about following Jesus. To be honest, I don't remember much about what he said because right before the service, he looked at me a few inches shorter and a lot more pounds lighter and looked at me and said, I got a bad back. So when I went under the water... I was supposed to go down a certain way so as to come up by myself out of the water. So whatever he said, I don't remember. I was a bit distracted. He raised his right hand in the air, said something like, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And under the water I went. My feet slipped off the fiberglass bottom. One foot shot out of the water as I tried to pull myself back upright. At the time, it felt like an eternity. I'm sure it was just a mere second or two. As I wiped the water from my face, the church was clapping. Folks were shouting, Amen. I climbed up the brown carpeted stairs and left a wet trail all the way down the hall into the men's room, where I quickly discovered I hadn't brought everything I needed for a dry change of clothes. I'll let you figure out what I forgot. After I toweled off and got dressed, though, I walked out a side door around the sanctuary, slipped in the back door, and sat in the back pew about where Jake is sitting. It was one of those muggy days in mid-September, just as it is now in South Alabama, where the summer always overstays its welcome. 
down there, the love bugs let you know that. So the air conditioner in the sanctuary was blowing full blast and coming through the vents in the ceiling. And I know because I was sitting under one of those vents, and as that cold air combed itself through my wet hair, I swear to you, friends, as sure as I am standing here right now, I heard something. It wasn't an audible voice, as if somebody had leaned over the pew and whispered in my ear. It wasn't like a vision where all of a sudden every other noise is muted just so you can hear what's going to be said clearly. It wasn't something like that. But it was more than just the sound of my own inner narrator. It was a voice, a call that said to me, Boy, you have gone and done it now. <laughs> you sound a lot more manly than that. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> they all saw what you did. And you can't take it back. My baptism didn't so much as wash away my past, though I know we sing that and say that. My baptism soaked me in a call towards something. Something else. Something more. Something, dare I say, disruptive and divine. For me, it was not an instance of initiation, a singular moment meant to prove that I was now part of the inner circle, that I could have the little cracker in the cup when it came by at communion. It was the beginning of something, an initial response to that first call from Christ to come and follow me. And from that moment to this one right now and all others hereafter, I have sought to live my life in answering that call, in pursuit of the God who calls, the God who is the call. The God who calls not just me and folks like me who stand here to preach. The God who calls me and the God who calls you. The God who calls Abram. Many of you have heard this story, I don't doubt. How God called Abram in the verses we've heard this morning to go from his country, from his kindred, from his father's house to the land that God would show him. It's a staple in VBS curriculum, a story that often adorns the walls of children's Sunday school classes. It's arguably the founding narrative of the three largest religions in the world. Even the Apostle Paul references it more than once, but as we've heard even this morning in his magnum opus to the Romans. As is the case so often, though, with these sorts of stories, our familiarity with them tends to create a chasm of understanding between us and the text, between our context and that of the narrative. So at first blush, this is a story about a man who answers this mysterious call from God to go to an unknown land, and in return, the Lord will give him that land and bless him. And Abram's positive response to this call, this divine call, initially hits us as a response of belief. That Abram must clearly believe in whatever voice it is that's telling him to do this. And Abram must believe that this voice is authoritative. And so he does what the voice tells him to do. This is why Paul says in Romans, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. We read this as a story about a man whose religious faith and trust in his God leads him to go to some undisclosed location so that he may be richly blessed by his God upon his arrival. But, as Paul Harvey used to say, that's not the rest of the story. It's not the whole story. You see, Abram's father... Tara was already heading in that direction. We're told in the verses just prior to the text we read this morning that Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. They're already going that way. 
But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. The land of Canaan is not some mysterious, unmarked place on the map. The call to Abram is not a call pointing him in an unknown direction. His dad was already heading that way. He just happened to stop and settle in Haran. Why? Who, who settles in Haran? Who knows? Maybe Haran had the nearest target. Maybe it had a good Mexican place with tamales. I don't know. But what I do know is that when Terah stopped to settle in Haran, so did his entire family. And that's a bigger deal than we may fully understand today. You see, the time of Terah and Abram is a time when people moved about the world as families, as tribes, as clans. It was a matter of survival as the seasons changed. There were periods of droughts and floods, migrating herds, the violence of enemies kept people always on the move. Nobody put stakes down too deep. And if a family settled in one place, it was because it was a good place, a safe place, a place where their family, tribe, or clan was either too large to be threatened or too isolated to be noticed. So for a family to settle in one place meant it was less of a risk than following the seasons, chasing after the herds, that the land was good and the livestock had plenty to eat. If a family settled in one place, they might go so far as to say that that place was blessed and that they were blessed. After all, one can imagine the peace of mind that comes with living in a safe place, not having to move from one place to the next for fear of what might find you. Not having to get up in the middle of the night, throw your clothes in a suitcase and go because they're knocking at the door and they're telling you you got to get out. You can imagine the safety and security that comes when you don't have to worry about another eviction notice. When you don't have to move across town and change schools again. You can imagine the peace of mind that comes with living in a safe place. Not having to move from one place to the next for fear of even starving to death. It makes me think of that family from my absolute favorite American novel, The Grapes of Wrath. John Steinbeck introduces us to the Jode family, sharecroppers uprooted by the, the effects of the Dust Bowl and the mechanization and industrialization of farmland. A family that begins to head out to the promised land of California where there's work, food, and a place to live. But along the way, the Jodes encounter others who've been displaced. Families like them who are just trying to find work and food. People who have been driven mad by the way the Dust Bowl just upturned their life. One season, there's plenty and food and meat on the table. And the next, the very walls of the house seem to fall in. They're violent people. Violent people who are out to take advantage of the downtrodden, especially young women and children. Angry people who meet them in every town and every city with axe handles and bats in their hand. They don't want them in their neighborhoods. They don't want them in their communities to bring down their way of living. They're coming to get their jobs. They're coming to get their food. Go on down the road. Go somewhere else. And along the way, they stay in horrible work camps where families live in tents and children play in garbage heaps. They stop along the road and sleep in their overloaded trucks. And family members die. Friends are lost. Enemies are gained. They're not sure who they can trust or what's going to happen, so they keep moving on. And if you've only seen Tom Ford's movie adaptation, first let me encourage you to read the book. But in that movie, the one with Henry Fonda, the Jode family finally makes it to California, to the promised land. And as Ma sits in the truck and looks over, even the sound of the music turns hopeful and safe as the Jodes drive down the hill and into the lush green orchards of California, a place where the family can finally settle and rest because it's safe. 
It wasn't too unlike the families, the tribes and clans of Terah and Abraham's day. To move around, finding where they need to be safe. This is why when they're settled in Haran, the call that comes to Abraham, to Abram, is so disruptive. Abram and Sarai are not simply a childless couple with the freedom to explore the world and take on some new adventures to add to their Instagram stories. Look at all these places we've gone. They're a part of this wider family system, complete with Abram's brothers and probably his sisters, their families, their servants, their livestock, the whole nine yards. And after Terah dies, Abram becomes the head of this household, the leader of this wide, interconnected family. So if Abram stays, they all stay. If Abram leaves, they all leave. And who's going to want to leave? After having traveled with Terah from Ur all the way to Haran, settled in the land, already bought a house, got the cable hooked up, signed on to a two-year contract with DirecTV. Those are hard to break. There they are. Who's going to want to leave this place? They've deemed to be safe, secure, stable. Abram, Sarai, and their entire family have settled in this place. And if God is going to call Abram, then why can't Abram go by himself? Just let Abram go alone. It's what Paula did. Sort of. My stepmom, Paula, when I was a senior in high school, was an assistant manager at the McDonald's in town. Wasn't a fancy job, but she liked it, especially working with the high school kids in the day and those she called the dropouts at night. I can even remember one night when her car wouldn't start. I had to pick her up late, and all the workers were hanging out in the smoking section, which sounds weird to say that they still had one of those that long ago in a McDonald's. And I know I smelled like Newports for a week. But Paula liked working the best with her friend Beth, who was the manager. And Beth was offered a job to manage a McDonald's in Foley, Alabama about three hours away. And she offered the assistant job to Paula. And Paula told my dad, he said, you can go. And so instead of saying no, Paula agreed, and my stepsister already lived in Foley, so she just moved into her apartment during the week and drove three hours one way home once a week. Dad didn't move. Paula didn't take any of her stuff, didn't even have her mail forwarded. She just went. She wanted the job, and so she went herself. Why can't Abram do that? You just go. Go. Couldn't Abraham do that? If he really felt strong enough about this calling from God, couldn't Abram just go himself, send a postcard back every once in a while, come visit over the weekends, or at least at Thanksgiving? Oh, y'all won't believe what I got over in Canaan. Look at all these blessings I have now. Maybe Sarai would want to tag along, but did everyone else have to go? Well, Actually, if you read it, no. Remember, the call was go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. But would Abraham want to go alone? Now, I'm a bit of an introvert, so I suppose that there's a certain sense of adventure a thrill of sorts in striking out alone, of heading into the call and the, uh, heading out into the wide unknown by yourself. These days I find myself scrolling through Instagram and, and Facebook just a bit envious of some of my single friends who are clearly living their best lives now. They're jet-setting to exotic destinations, walking down crowded streets in some of the most ancient cities in the world, seeing the most amazing beaches, visiting some of the great wonders of the world. And yeah, today there's something thrilling, I suppose, uh, about striking out there on your own, tethered to the world you know, the world that's safe by your smartphone and a global network of connectivity. But that wasn't the case for Abram. Abram's safety, his security is with his family, his kindred, in his father's house, in the proven safety of Haran. To leave would almost certainly mean his death. Because to go alone without provisions, he wouldn't last long. And to travel with enough alone would certainly mean he'd attract the wrong kind of attention. So this call, this call that comes to Abram, isn't just some notion regarding his belief about God. This call isn't just some suggestion, an inherited responsibility from his father. 
This call to Abram isn't just a call of future blessings, riches, and comfort. This call is nothing short of a disruption for Abram. A rending apart of his family, a contradiction to the cultural norms and societal securities, which would ensure Abram, Sarai, and all of those under their care would not only have a chance to survive, but to thrive in Haran. This call is so much more than a discernment of vocation or the weighing of risks against rewards. This call Abram experiences is not too unlike that which I experienced 17 years ago. That disruptive call is God. And I mean that in the way theologian John Caputo means it. That God is the very call itself. Caputo says God does not exist, God calls. God does not subsist, God insists. God is not an absolute being, but an unconditional call. In other words, the way we know God, the way we experience God is in the call. And the way God becomes real to us is in our response to the call. Whether we seek to follow it, simply ignore it, or outright reject it. And I believe this is why Abram goes. Because the call, the disruption, God won't let him go. Because God doesn't just call us once as if it were a summons to appear in court. But like the father in Jesus' prodigal son parable, God continues to call us. To wait on us. To wait for us to respond to God's presence in the call. It's not a sales pitch. It's not a transaction. It's not just an RSVP to the reception after the service of this life. No, God is the call that too often disrupts our comfort, disrupts our safety, our security. God is the call that that comes when we finally figured out, when we finally decided what we're going to do with our lives. The call comes. God is the call that comes when you've settled into the rhythms and rituals of your religion just long enough for them to become rote. The disruption comes. God is the call that keeps you up at night, that won't leave you alone, that makes your heart beat faster when we sing the invitation hymn. God is the call that makes you turn the channel when the news comes on of all of those without power, food, and water in the Bahamas. God is the one that won't leave you alone until you respond one way or another. God is the call that says to those of us who have left our kindred, our father's house, to those of us who've given up our cultural safety and security, to those of us who've passed through the waters of baptism, declaring to the world that we will not follow its call, but we will now follow God's call. It says to us, you've gone and done it now. And there is no turning back. God is the call. God is calling you. And I think you know it. You felt it. It keeps you up at night. It won't leave you alone. It makes you question so much. God is calling. You know God is. Because you can't just walk away from it. You can't just make the decision and say, I got enough of that. You can't just take up the comfort of what's in front of you because that disruption of God's calling calls you. God is calling. And you know God is. God's calling you right now. What are you going to do about it? Let's pray together. (coughs) Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the one who called Abram, the one who now in the Holy Spirit calls us. Help us, Lord, to hear that call. Give us strength even more, Lord, to heed that call. 
to follow you wherever you may call us. The cross before us, the world behind us. Though none may go with us, Lord, still call us to follow. Lord, we know you call us. Give us your spirit and strength now, Lord, to respond. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.